Excellent. Okay. Well, I think I will kick us off. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning back into our weekly Science Talks webinar series. Today, we are joined by Dr. Mary Santelman to learn more about the findings of UN Project D11, multi-scale evaluation of alternative future scenarios for urban development. Dr. Santelman earned her PhD in ecology from the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, St. Paul, advised by Regents Professor Evil. Did I say that right? Yeah, Evel, right. Mm -hmm. Evel, okay, Evel Gora. She is currently a professor in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University and serves as the director of the Water Resources Graduate Program. Her research interests include the study of ecosystem response to human land use and management practices, use of alternative future scenarios combined with diverse evaluative approaches, the study of environmental and anthropogenic influences on species composition and species richness in urban, wetland, and agricultural systems, the effects of landscape composition and pattern on native biodiversity, and the ecology and biogeochemistry of wetlands and riparian systems. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mary. Well, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. And it's nice to see all the UN colleagues here. Um, so I just want to say at the beginning that Oregon State University is located in the traditional homelands of the Ampanafu Band of the Kalapuya and following the Willamette Valley Treaty of the 1855, these people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon, but today living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Rhone Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz. And I want to give a shout out to all my UN collaborators, um, Roy Haggerty, Maria Wright, Michelle Talal, Michael Chincharuli Harrison, Kelly Vache, Fatima Taha, Hattie Gradanas, and then our, our colleagues from the University of Oregon, David Hulse, Chris Enright, Alan Branscombe, and then Freshwater Simulations colleague, David Conklin. So like, like the larger UN project, the Oregon UN project is, uh, is a interdisciplinary and multi-institutional um, project. So the question we were asking with our part of this project is, can innovative urban water system design and management mitigate the impacts of climate change and population growth? And we wanted to look at that, that question across multiple scales. And so as many of you already remember, the, the, our project was a stakeholder guided project where we developed alternative future scenarios and then worked to assess those scenarios at the basin scale for the whole Willamette River Basin, the watershed scale for Chicken Creek, an urbanizing basin uh, in the southwest of Portland and at the neighborhood scale. And so with our scenario design uh, as guided by David Hulse and his team and then and in which our stakeholder advisory committee participated, we developed three feature scenarios in an iterative way. We would uh, bring our ideas and listen to, to their ideas, go away and, and implement uh, some representations and bring them back to the group and go out to the watershed. Um, and, and with this process, we were varying different scenarios of climate change and rates of population growth, and then how humans respond in terms of how they design and manage the urban environments. So these designs were then eventually implemented as GIS-based representations of landscape change across the Willamette River Basin at three scales. And so that looked like this for the what we called the current course, where the current regulatory regime and policies remain in place, um, and in which we envisioned a, uh, a slightly more moderate uh, temperature change and moderate uh, changes in population growth, about two and a half degrees Celsius increase in mean annual temperature, with with more variable precipitation increase but much less snow and a final population of four and a half million people in 2060 and about half a percent of the forest area in the basin burns annually. Now that, that sort of moderate climate change um, and, and current regulatory regime is in contrast to the other two scenarios in which we have a much steeper increase in mean annual temperature, about 4.2 degrees Celsius by um, 2060 a population increase of 6.2 million, um, 
and increased precipitation, but variable throughout the basin. And then in the integrated water future, where both uh, proactive planning and water management in urban areas uh, anticipate this change, we would expect to see about 0.95%, about 1% about of the forest area burning annually, but in the stressed resources scenario where water management lags behind change and infrastructure is stretched is stressed and there isn't this anticipatory effort to plan. Not only do you get those same increases in mean annual temperature and population growth, but 1.4% of your forest area burns annually. And we will see how the um, those different uh, planning and design elements uh, result in hydrologic differences among the alternative futures. So at the basin scale, here is the Willamette River Basin uh, in Oregon, and you can see the Pacific Ocean off to the west. Um, the uh, kind of brownish area here is, is on the far left is agriculture, and that is the, the valley, the Willamette Valley portion of the basin with the coast range to the west and the Cascades to the east. So our um, Urbanizing watershed Chicken Creek is southwest of Portland. Portland is up in the um, kind of the central part of the basin in the north. And here's the Chicken Creek watershed. And then within Chicken Creek, this is our urbanizing neighborhood um, where we envision three different types of development. And this uh, multi scale approach is described in our paper in Urban Ecosystems from 2019. So we also tried to have fit for purpose modeling. You know, the, the same model isn't appropriate for use at all the different scales. So at the Willamette Basin scale, we use the Envision model um, and the inputs for climate change. And there's an autonomous processes that incorporate population growth and then the management and technology choices. For the basin scale, we looked at urban expansion. The, the model has uh, autonomous processes that incorporate fire and forest disturbance and regrowth, crop and irrigation decisions, and operation of reservoirs, runoff and stream flow. At the watershed scale, we modified the Envision model and incorporated the stormwater management model SWIM uh, in order to use that to at a finer scale, model water imports and exports, uh, ecosystem services, and the impacts of riparian buffers and green infrastructure. And then finally, at the neighborhood scale, we used the SWIM-5 model uh, by itself and looked at water supply and conservation efforts, network-based GI solutions, and, um, and translated those into performance, water system performance indicators. So here's the Willamette River Basin in another image. And now um, you can see the different sub-basins within the region. One of the things that we want to emphasize is that there are really different responses in the watersheds that are in the far eastern part, those the four, actually really five of South Santiam included, that are in the Cascades or with a significant proportion of the watershed in the Cascades versus the Willamette Valley in this kind of uh, light green here in the middle, and then also in contrast to the basins that have a portion of the basin in the coast range. And so um, the, the geographic location within the basin matters in terms of the climate response and also in terms of land management. And so in these areas, you can see, for example, that the changes in um, snow water equivalent. So in this graph, the, this is actually from work, the same model was used in Willamette Water 2100. So this is actually a, a figure that I liked from Willamette Water 2100 that shows the change in basin average maximum snow water equivalent. And so the, the vertical axis here is the change and um, the horizontal axis is over time going from 2010 to 2100. And a decrease in snow is a red color and, a, and an increase is in a blue color. So you can see here that even though this, this is uh, the overall average for the entire basin, um, you can see that the, the snow water equivalent is declining uh, dramatically over time. When you look at the changes, where those changes are happening, they're happening in the Cascades, in these watersheds. Um, where the headwaters are in the Cascades and the Willamette Valley and the Coast Range aren't seeing uh, that much of a change 
in in snow because they don't get much snow. Um, what we have done here is to look at these ecological climate diagrams. So if you're familiar with Heinrich Walter's work, you know that these are uh, diagrams in which there's a, the mean monthly averages are, so the month of the year is on the x-axis, and then the red curve is the mean monthly temperature, and the blue line is the mean monthly precipitation, and these uh, bars uh, along the, the time axis here are months of the year when the temperature can go below freezing, so there's a danger of frost, and the, the vertical hatching are times of the year when it's relatively humid, and then this red stippling are the times of the year when that, um, that temperature increase uh, crosses the precipitation line. Precipitation, uh, there's very little precipitation in summer in the Pacific Northwest, and you can see this red stippling in the periods of drought here um, in, in the 2010 decade. And then those are all increasing in tw between 2050 to 2060. So uh, a more uh, significant period of dryness in the summer as uh, uh, climate changes. And so what does this look like across scale and what, what matters at what scale? Well, the impacts of development, of course, you see the, the percent impervious area in the West Sherwood neighborhood, uh, uh, that's, a, a dramatic increase over the percent impervious surface that you see before prior to development. Um, at the Chicken Creek watershed scale, it's lower. At the Tualatin Basin scale, it's even less. And at the scale of the whole Lamet Basin, even uh, over 60 years of development, it you're not seeing a uh, substantial change. Those changes are really are strongly felt at the neighborhood scale and not much else. And in contrast, um, on the, in the graph on the right, we have the same uh, progression of the neighborhood, watershed, base, Tualatin Basin, and Willamette River Basin. You can see that the impact of fire is, uh, is most intense and, and separates out these watersheds most at the basin scale, with the current course having a much lower uh, proportion of the basin burned. And then, um, and also the highest proportion of forest, right? Because the Willamette River Basin has about um, 16,000 square kilometers of forest. Uh, that amount drops off as you get to the Tualatin Basin and, and the Chicken Creek Basin. And there's a very little forested landscape in the West Sherwood neighborhood. So the different impacts of, uh, of these different changes that are coming either as in response to urban development or in response to climate change are impacting uh, the basin at different scales. The, this work that was published in Landscape and Urban Planning in 2021 is a nice integration, I think, of these, um, the effects of both development and the impacts of having forest or not having a uh, forested landscape in the watershed because in the Chicken Creek watershed here on in the figure in the upper left, you can see that the present day uh, watershed is less than a quarter of the land is in development and there's riparian forest and there's also upland forest on the southeast corner of the watershed. And with the current course, it's, you know, a little bit um, of an increase in development, but um, but you start really seeing that increase in development in the stressed resources where there's not much of a focus on, on retaining um, undeveloped area within development, but instead uh, low and moderate density development extends throughout larger portions of the watershed. And then comparing that with the integrated water future where there's a distinct effort in preserving riparian forest and other uh, natural vegetation, even within the developed area. And this is done by having uh, increased density in the development that does happen in all that new development. And the row of the core scenarios, which you call them on the top, that's the extent of development that we would uh, anticipate seeing by 2060, uh, what would be realistic. But when we brought those images back to our stakeholders, they said, well, that's okay, but you know, there's not much of a difference um, here where you're only going out to 2060. Um, you start off with about 14.2% impervious surface in your watershed. and and even in the stressed resources, you only get up to 20% impervious service. What would happen if 
you use these same development patterns and developed out the entire watershed. So we went back and, and, and ran that scenario as well. And so the row of scenarios on the bottom is what would happen if you use the same patterns of development that we use for the current course to 2060 and then built out the entire watershed with that pattern. Uh, similarly, for the stressed resources and the integrated water future, these are all what we call the build out scenarios. And you can read about those in that paper in landscape and urban planning. But here's a, a quick rundown of what, what does happen. So here is uh, what we call a Sankey diagram, which shows the fate of precipitation in the watershed. And in this particular diagram, you see the no development scenario. And so the width of this blue bar on the left is proportional to the amount of water that you're, um, that you're seeing uh, fall as precipitation. And in the no development scenario, this orange bar is the proportion of that precip that's going, that's falling on undeveloped areas, and the purple bar is the proportions falling on developed areas. Well, then what happens to it? Well, in undeveloped areas, more, more than half of it goes to evapotranspiration. There's lots of natural vegetation, lots of forest, and, and you get significant rates of evapotranspiration. There's also some infiltration into the, um, into the subsurface, which eventually flows to streams on an annual basis. Um, the developed areas have some municipal supply imported, and that also goes to municipal wastewater. Some of uh, the precip that falls on developed areas also goes to evapotranspiration, but it doesn't account for very much of the annual ET for for Chicken Creek watershed, um, and then some of it goes to the, is infiltrated into the subsurface, and then again, on an annual basis, that moves to the streams. In our build-out scenarios, the, for example, the stressed resources scenario, um, get a little bit more precipitation, but you get a lot more of uh, an augmentation of that municipal supply here, um, and most of the precipitation that falls on that watershed is falling on developed areas. So you can see the width of that blue bar is much larger and very little of it's falling on undeveloped areas. And the, the biggest change that you see is, is how little evapotranspiration there is, again, on an annual basis, um, and how even when you get infiltration of the of the precipitation in the developed areas, infiltration into the subsurface, it's still um, on an annual basis moving through that subsurface to the streams. Um, so the, the, there's a change in the hydrologic regime that has to do with these developed areas. And the, the largest change is the loss of ET. Um, and then this, even with, uh, infiltration into the subsurface and efforts to um, to keep runoff to a minimum, you're still on an annual basis, a lot of that uh, water is going to the stream and and it's a significant change. I'm gonna just pop back to the no development. You can see what a, a significant change that is from the original hydrograph. And again, in the under the no development scenario, most of the uh, precip that's falling isn't just running straight off, it's moving through the subsurface here. And then the integrated water future build out where we're trying to retain uh, more natural vegetation and, um, and which incorporates uh, substantial amounts of green infrastructure. Here, the, uh, there's, there are still changes. You're still seeing a decrease in ET, but that decrease is lower. Um, and you have more of the precipice falling on undeveloped areas and a, a larger amount is being infiltrated that's coming through the developed areas to the subsurface and moving to the streams. But the, the relative size of the what's going to ET and what's eventually ending up in the stream uh, is a little bit closer to the, the undeveloped uh, current scenario. So we wanted to also think about, well, what are the different aspects? These, the scenarios contain many different types of changes. There are lots of elements to these designs. And so, um, you know, there's, there's harvesting forest or, or forest removal. There are two different climate scenarios and there's the 
two different spatial extents, the what you the build the development that you see by 2060 and then the development that you see if you built if you did that build out scenario um and we, we wanted to say which of these things are having the the greatest impact are responsible for the changes that we're seeing and and so we put the um results of the hydrologic modeling so the outcomes of each model run into a multivariate uh ordination and these are the results of that ordination for each of the different scenarios and so these four scenarios here are the no development scenarios in which you're changing the climate and you're changing um, the the forest harvest options but uh, because it's not developed you don't have with or without low impact the the green infrastructure added um, the open symbols here of the the squares and the inverted triangles and the triangles those are for the core scenarios the ones that are only developed to the extent that you would see by 2060 and then the scenarios at the far left are in order uh, the integrated water future kind of in the middle here the current course and then the the stressed resources scenario at the far left. And it's a couple things I want to point out. First, the, the, the proportion of mature forest left in the landscape is a significant factor um, that's correlated with the location on axis one. And it goes in an opposite direction from the number of dwelling units that are present and the amount of impervious surface. So we can see the stressed resources is sitting in in that uh, high impervious surface, high number of dwelling units portion of, of this ordination plot. And uh, in many cases, um, these, these sort of pairs of, of symbols that you see are with and without um, the added features of constructed low impact development. So what we call without low impact development means you only have detention ponds, you don't have uh, bioswales, green roofs, infiltration trenches, or uh, rainwater harvesting rain barrels. And in the with LID, you have all of those features. We were trying, again, to compare what things are making the difference here. And, and really the only differences you, you see are in the build out scenarios and you see the biggest difference in the stressed resources where um, having that low impact development, if you're going to develop large areas of the watershed and you're going to have lots of impervious surface, that's where the um, those constructed features start to make a difference in the um, hydrologic variables and and that's where they start to show up. But in general, um, the, the biggest impact is the extent of how much of the watershed is developed, the difference between these open symbols and and the filled symbols over here. And then the integrated water future um, is, is really quite different. It's, it separates itself out in this uh, build out future from the other two scenarios as being closer to both the no development scenario and closer to the scenarios in which less of the watershed is built up. Now moving to the neighborhood scale, um, where we looked at the impacts of green infrastructure just uh, using the SWIM model. Here you can see some um, higher resolution images of what that looks like at the neighborhood scale. And you can see in the current course, um, there, there's more low density development and there's fewer dwelling units. And so you still have more green and open space. And you have more green and open space also in the integrated water future because it's purposefully kept there. And then you have these green boulevards, that's that kind of olive green that you see. And then the development that you see here in gray as impervious surface, those are um, those are higher density developments. And so the number of dwelling units, the, the, the stressed resources in an integrated water future are able to house the same number of people, but they do it um, with different development um, densities. And here is the rainfall runoff from a two-year storm from the a design storm run the swim. And you can see that the, so here's the precipitation along the, the top, how much rain is falling at um, within the uh, 24 hours of the storm. And the 
orange is the stressed resources and you can see that peak flows are much higher and occur then they ramp up more rapidly and the lowest peak is for the integrated water future with the low impact development features that um, encourage infiltration and so they are distinctly different for a design storm and uh, here is the an image of the rainfall runoff. So here on the left, runoff as a percent of total precipitation is uh, that vertical axis, and on the horizontal axis is the amount of precipitation in that particular storm. So for example, in a two-year storm, that's a little more than six centimeters. That's the, the diagram we saw previously. And you can see that now about 40% of that precip is running off um, for these the stressed resources. Um, with and without LID, whereas the in the biggest contrast is for the integrative integrated water future, only about 15% of the precip falling is running off, and and that same pattern continues as you increase for the 25-year storm, 100-year storm. Here we did the 25-year storm at 20% at greater intensity and the 25-year storm at 30% greater intensity. Um, but the relative rankings just stay the same. We also did 10 year runs or that, that's the Royal we the uh, Michael Chincherly Harrison did all these 10 year simulations. And, and here again, we have runoff as percent of total precipitation. And, but these are over the course of 10 years. And, um, and again, you see the integrated water feature with low impact development is uh, on, on the basis of 10 years, less than 10% of the rainfall, whereas when you're up in the, with the stressed resources, yet um, between 30 and 35% of the rainfall is running off in these 10 year simulations. So um, what was the answer to our question? Can innovative design and management mitigate the impacts of climate change and population growth? Well, of course the answer is it, yes, but it depends, right? At the scale of the Willamette Basin, the impacts of development are far outweighed by the impacts of climate change. And you, you, regardless of the future, you are seeing an increase in fire, you see an increase in summer drought and an increase in the loss of snow storage. So we, if we wanna um, make an impact on climate change, we have to change something about our carbon emissions. We're not gonna be able to, to uh, mitigate that too much with land management. Some, but not, uh, not, uh, not enough. Um, so the innovative policies and designs like, like we have in the integrated water future, both at the, at the development scale and as we would envision an innovative uh, land management at the basin scale, they can reduce, but they cannot eliminate the impacts of climate change. And similarly, you have neighborhood designs that include retention of open space and maintaining riparian areas as protected areas they'll do a better job of maintaining the original hydrology, um, but they will not, they will still be different. And, um, and so you, they will not be identical to the original hydrology. So combining innovative design and stormwater management features can make them even more effective, but they can't um, keep them showing the same hydrologic regimes as you would have with no development. So I just want to acknowledge that the results here were produced with assistance from our stakeholders. We really want to thank our stakeholder advisory committee for all of their assistance on this and their, their faithfulness through several years of meetings um, and our colleagues on the, on the UN network and support from the National Science Foundation. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, Mary. Much appreciated. Any questions for Dr. Santelman? Feel free to turn your camera and mic on. I guess I should do the same. <laughs> well, Mary, I just say very nice presentation. I, I think an awful lot of information summarized there really concisely. I'm also struck just by the coincidence of timing. I don't know how many of you are regular readers of the online New York Times, but a, a group called First Street released a nationwide map of fire risk projecting out to 2060 today. And so I think the, the finding about the relative importance of 
forest cover in particular is uh, just kind of striking because the more of that you have, of course, depending on whether it's managed well for fire risk or not, the more fire risk you have. So just uh, nice job, Mary. Thanks, Dave. And thanks for the wonderful scenarios that you and your team built uh, for this project. They're truly a thing of beauty. Yeah, well, you did a nice job of demonstrating why it might be handy to have them. <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, and, and then I also start thinking, um, you know, models are only as good as you as you make them. And uh, I was thinking about the impact of fire. And of course, the impact, the direct impacts of fire are, are felt at the basin scale. But, you know, then I think back to what we call the smoke apocalypse of 2020 and in the whole basin, because we had unusual winds that were coming from the east to the west the basin filled with smoke. And uh, that was an impact in the urban areas as well as in the upland forested areas. So, um, so we almost need to kind of rethink how we, how, what we think of as an impact and how that impact is felt uh, across scales because those impacts are felt both at the neighborhood scales, but we don't have a way of showing that yet. Any other questions or comments for Mary? Michael, nice to see you. It's been a while. All right, well, I'm not hearing too much from the audience, so I think we can go ahead and conclude. I'll get this video processed and edited and posted to our YouTube channel. Um, for the couple PIs that are out there, looking forward to seeing you in a uh, couple of months, or not a couple of months, a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, my dates are a little wacky. At the end of June, we look forward to welcoming everyone back to Fort Collins, and uh, I wish you guys all the best wrapping up your semesters, and take care. Hope to see you on Wednesday for our citizen science presentation. Absolutely. Thanks for your time, Mary. Great presentation. Thank you, too. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.